of in conversation decided that it would be beneficial to have a have a class, have a program where we talk to folks about all the really interesting ways that you can use the food that you grow. Um, and if you're not growing food, use all of the food that you can when you buy food um, from the store. And so um, I, as a horticulture agent, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what you can do when you are growing some of these plants. Now, some of this information is specific to our area in Florida. Um, and so some of the seasons may be different, particularly for our, our friend from Ontario. Um, but a, a lot of the kind of principles remain. Um, and so I will go ahead and I'll give the first portion of the presentation talking about some of these plants, how to grow them, what we use. Um, and then Andrea is going to talk to you all about how to use all these parts of the plants that I say that you can and give you some recipes and ideas and talk about the nutrition. Um, so Andrea, let's go ahead and let's get started with the next slide. Kind of agreement between Florida's land grant universities and local county government to provide education to our, our communities. And as you can see, our community in the, in the um, internet age really has expanded beyond just our own local counties, but really um, to the whole state, the whole country, and, and even the whole world. I've had webinars recently where I've had folks join in from overseas from many different countries. So we're excited to be able to talk to folks and share this information. Um, if you are out of state, you most likely have a county extension office or at least a state extension program. Every state in the country does have a land grant university. We're gonna talk um, about care and growing, uses and recipes. I'm gonna go over a little bit of composting basics and then we'll give you a summary for today. Doesn't that picture look scrumptious? I wish I could grow artichoke like that here in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just to introduce the topic, uh, the United Nations Environment Program put out a report in 2021 that looked at food waste across the entire globe. And if you looked at um, food waste as a contributor to climate change, it would be on par, like if you compared it um, to countries, we would be, it would be the third largest country in the world um, for, for global um, carbon emissions. And so we really, we know that food waste is a huge contributor to global climate issues. Um, nearly 570 million tons of food waste is produced by households each year. Um, when we look at the, the different kind of mitigation methods that are, are recommended for climate, food waste is one of the number one um, kind of methods that you see over and over again for, for mitigating climate change. What was really interesting about this United Nations report was that as you looked across a broad swath of socioeconomic factors, the food waste really remained um, about on par. So the average for, for households didn't really change based on their socio socioeconomic um, status. And so this is really interesting to me because you would think that people who have more affluence would be more likely to waste food. But it really just seems like we don't have a good idea of how to manage the food that we do have. Um, you know, not only does food waste contribute to uh, pollution, poor water quality, and carbon emissions, but it also increases food insecurity. When we have food being wasted, there's less food available um, that can be given to people who really need it. You know, when we look at issues of, of hunger, starvation, malnutrition uh, across the globe, we really don't have a problem being able to make enough food. We can make enough food for everybody, but we don't always get that food to the people who need it, okay? And so our program today aims to provide you with some tools so that you can use as much of your food as possible and maybe adding some fun and nutrition to your diet. I love this, um, this quote, you are far less likely to waste food when you have nurtured it from a seed into a plant. And I really, um, you know, the first time I was able to successfully grow a tomato in Florida, I wanted to like, shoot off fireworks and like throw a fanfare um, because nurturing plants to fruition is such an incredible process. And when you actually get to eat the food that you've grown, it tastes a hundred times better. There might be spots on it. You might have to like 
cut out that little, you know, fruit fly larva, um, but you're going to eat as much of it as you can and you are going to relish every bite, especially when it's taken a long time for you to be able to successfully grow something that you can eat. So when you are thinking about food re waste reduction and you are somebody who has a garden and you, you grow food with the intent to eat it, right? Um, it really does, reduction starts when you're planning your garden, okay? So I am as guilty as the next person. Um, I go to the nursery and I see a plant and I think, ooh, I have to have that plant. Um, or, you know, what's more common is I get my um, I get my Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds catalog and I start flipping through it with my daughter and we start circling all of the plants we want and all of the seeds. And next thing you know, I've got like 50 seed packets coming in the mail. Um, but when we are planning our garden, we want to make sure that we are putting plants in the ground that we are going to eat, right? Just because you see this like beautiful, variegated amaranth, um, if you're not going to eat it, then, then you shouldn't be putting it in the garden, right? Unless it has some kind of pollinator benefit or something like that. What can you also realistically grow? I love Brussels sprouts. Ooh, roasted Brussels sprouts, absolutely love them. I know how hard it is to grow Brussels sprouts in my area of Florida. And so I just don't even try, right? I might really want to grow something or I really want to eat something that I've grown. But if I know that it's going to be incredibly difficult or there's going to be a lot of pests that I'm going to have to deal with, I'm not going to put that plant in my garden. Next, we have to think about our selection right? So choose plants that are suited to your site. Oh, one other thing about planning that I want to mention. If you are on a property and you're planning to plant in the ground, not in raised beds, not in containers, but in the ground, I highly recommend that you do a soil test, not just for pH and salts and things like that, but you can get your soil tested for legacy um, pollutants like lead. Uh, it's really important because some of our houses were built before there were lead paint standards. And so you need to make sure that your soil is, is safe for planting things that you're going to eat, okay? So, so that's an important thing to remember in planning. When you're selecting plants for your site, make sure to choose the ones that are suited for your area, right? I am not going to plant asparagus. I am not gonna plant Brussels sprouts because I live in central Florida and I don't want the headache of trying to grow those things here way outside of their optimum zone. I want to choose varieties and cultivars that will maximize production as well, right? I'm planting this garden to eat this food, not just to look at some pretty flowers, but I want to, I want to eat it. So I'm going to want to choose cultivars or varieties of these foods that will really produce a lot of food for me. I'm also going to look for cultivars or varieties that are resistant to known pests and diseases. You can find seeds um, and transplants that are uh, bred for resistance to nematodes, as well as some of the um, viruses and other um, issues that we have here in Florida. So look for those kind of resistant varieties or cultivars when you're choosing. When you design your garden, when, you, when you're looking at where you're actually going to put your plants in the ground, remember to think about their mature size, okay? I get, I get super plant happy, and I plant way too many plants next to each other, right? If our plants are crowded in our gardens, we're going to have a higher risk of pests and disease. There's going to be less airflow and there's less opportunity for fruit to grow. So we really want to provide enough space for our plants. Plan for succession planting. So plant things in October and then that, that you're going to harvest in January. Then plant things in November that you're going to harvest in March or April. Okay. I'm talking uh, Florida seasons right now for my person up in Ontario, you're probably thinking, what are you talking about? <laughs> um, but our growing seasons are flipped here in Florida. And a lot of our, um, 
a lot of the traditional summer crops from more northern areas we're growing in the the fall and winter here um, interplant as well so things that are low growing with things that are tall um, things that can twine around so this a really great example of this um, is the the three sisters right corn beans and squash um, we have to kind of vary up a little bit here in Florida with with what kinds of, of things we're using as our as our trellis for our beans, but we have good squashes, we have great beans, we can grow corn here. Um, so think about interplanting and the way that you can design your garden to maximize your space. Care for your plants. Don't just, you know, put them in and turn on the sprinkler and walk away. We have to we have to go out and we have to engage with our gardens on an almost daily basis. We need to scout them for pests and disease. This means going out, flipping over the leaves, looking for evidence of insects, looking for evidence of disease, paying attention to their watering requirements making sure that they that they look like they're getting enough nutrition, right? Watching for any signs of yellowing or wilting or fruit drop that might indicate that we need to add some additional nutrition to the soil. When we are going to address issues that arise, and they will, right? You will have white fly, you will get powdery mildew, um, you will have tomato hornworms, right? They will show up. But using integrated pest management methods will allow you to choose the least toxic option first so that you can minimize your chemical inputs in your garden and therefore you will end up consuming less of those chemical inputs um, when you harvest your food. Harvesting is really important, right? Don't let your food sit on the plant. Um, I know this was a just a awesome year for cherry tomatoes. I really should take mine out of the ground, but um, I am still getting so much fruit off of them that I have left them alone. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to get to all of that fruit when it's ripe. If we don't get to the fruit when it's ripe, we invite molds, we invite um, pests, birds, um, to come in and start learning to use our garden as a food source, okay? Watch them for optimum harvest. Sometimes it makes sense to pick them a little bit early. You know, I just went out this past weekend and every cluster of cherry tomatoes that had one red cherry on it, even if all the rest were green, I just snipped that whole cluster and I'm keeping them all together so they can ripen together on my counter. Okay, so learn when is the right time to harvest, watch your plants for harvest, um, and make sure that you're utilizing all of that available food. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So um, some of the things that we're going to talk about today are uh, root vegetables, and these are things like radishes, carrots, beets, turnips. In Florida, we're going to grow these October to January in the cool season. Um, most of these you're going to want to direct sow. You can transplant um, beets and turnips and radishes, but they're a little bit picky when you do so. Carrots, you really don't want to transplant them. You want to direct sow the seed, um, but you will need to thin them. The carrots need thinning if you don't. Um, and, and I know it's sad to pull those little baby carrot plants out. But if you don't do that, you won't get the maximum yield from the carrots that do grow. One of the main things that people tend to not think about with these root vegetables is that we can eat the greens. And we should eat the greens, especially on beets and turnips. Oh, they're delicious. Um, radishes are kind of spicy, the greens are. And carrots, you don't want to use, you know, too much. Um, but Radish greens and carrot greens make great pesto. Um, and Andrew's gonna talk about that a little later on. Next slide. Our sweet potatoes. Um, we have many different varieties that we can plant here in Florida, purple, yellow, orange, heirloom, like Southern specific, region, region specific, um, sweet potatoes, all kinds of options there. This is a summer crop, which is great for us because there aren't very many things that we can grow successfully through the summer. The stems and leaves are both edible. Um, and I want to make sure to put a point in here, like Irish potatoes, like white potatoes, um, the ones you would make French fries out of, these potatoes are not the same. 
hang on a second. Yes, okay. Um, these, somebody just popped up a, a question. These potatoes are not the same. They're in the Solanaceae family and the leaves and stems are poisonous. So please do not eat the leaves and stems of Irish potatoes, okay? Only sweet potatoes. Next is our brassicas. So these are cauliflowers, broccolis, Brussels sprouts, um, anything that kind of falls into that category. There's a really great shirt that I still wanna buy. Um, it has a wild mustard plant at the top and then underneath it has all of the things that come from the wild mustard plant. Um, all of these brassicas once were a wild mustard plant, um, and uh, we can use a lot of the parts that we tend to throw away. Um, this, again, is a cool season crop in Florida, October through January. Some fruits that we can grow um, here in our area of Florida. Muscadine grape is one of my favorite ones because not only is the fruit edible, but the leaves are also edible. Um, it is a summer crop, meaning I usually harvest mine in July every year. It is perennial. You want to trim it back. It's going to need a trellis. They really get big if you let them get big, um, but they make great um, jelly and um, and juice and the um, and you can use them in tarts and things like that. And the leaves are edible as well. Strawberries, we're going to plant them September to November and we're harvesting April to May. Um, so, so strawberries really have kind of a, a limited season. We are some of the first strawberries available on the market, Florida strawberries. Um, and Andrea is going to talk to you about some kind of uncommon ways you can use strawberries. Bananas are another great one because if you plant one banana, you will have bananas forever <laughs> because they self-reproduce. They create little baby pups that are genetically identical. And so once you have one banana tree, you'll see as it gets close to putting out its inflorescence, its flower, which then becomes the fruit, you'll see a new baby banana tree starting to grow from the base. You can divide that from the main parent and you end up with a new banana tree. Um, there are several incredible varieties. I absolutely recommend to not plant a Cavendish banana. Cavendish is the kind of banana you find at the grocery store. Um, there are a lot of issues in the kind of large scale banana production world with Cavendish bananas and, and some diseases. And so as much as we can encourage people to get different varieties, there are red bananas, there are purple bananas, there are variegated bananas that look incredibly beautiful. Um, for those folks who live outside of Florida, bananas actually do quite well in containers. So you can actually do a banana tree in a container in a protected area um, on your property as well. And don't forget to use those leaves. Banana leaves are great for wrapping and steaming and, and cooking foods, especially like fish. Um, there's a really great dish that is from, I believe, Nicaragua that has... Um, that has uh, potatoes and chicken and peppers, and it's all cooked inside of a banana leaf. It's amazing. Um, so don't forget to use those leaves. With our squashes, we have the summer squashes that we plant in March to May. These are zucchinis, yellow squashes, patty pan squashes, um, and then winter squashes we plant January through April. And those are things like pumpkins, butternuts, acorns. Calabaza is a really great um, hard squash that we can can plant here in central Florida. It does really well with our subtropical climate um, and it produces huge, really delicious orange fruit, very much like a pumpkin. With pumpkins, you have to remember it's not just the, the squash that you can eat, but you can also eat the leaves of the pumpkins. Make really delicious. You can make a pumpkin stew with pumpkin leaves and serve it in a pumpkin. <laughs> All right, and then herbs. Um, we have some herbs that will perennialize here in Florida, rosemary, mint, fennel. Um, there are lots of annual herbs, basil, cilantro, parsley. There are some herbs that um, should be planted in October through January. Others can be planted throughout the year. One of the things I would suggest is that herbs really do great in containers. And so if you have space to have containers, um, planting yourself a little you know, herb garden in several containers is a good way to kind of um, keep them uh, in place. Mint will, um, if you plant it in the ground, it, it will sprawl, it'll, it'll pop up all over the place. I like that because I really like mint. I like to use it in a lot of things. Um, but one thing to remember with 
herbs is if you end up with too much, you can make pestos, chimichurris, seasoned oils, seasoned salts, or preserves. Tomato basil jam is delicious, a great way to use some of that extra basil and extra tomatoes you have. Um, so so don't, don't forget to, to use those herbs. And then there are also lots of things that we can um, eat the seeds of that we don't realize. Watermelon, pumpkin, cantaloupe, papaya, sunflower, all of these things that we you know, frequently grow in our area, we can roast them, add them to soups, porridges, salads, or blend into pestos. Um, and they're a really great way to add some additional nutrition to some of those dishes. And now we're gonna hand it over to Andrea. Thank you so much. And Alyssa, if you have notes or things, just feel free to jump in, okay? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the recipes, things, ways to use them, and nutritional benefits. I was having a lot of fun looking up a lot of different things. I have tried some of these myself, but I have a whole handful that I'm going to try after learning a lot more on this presentation. So I just wanted to um, echo what Alyssa said about the food waste, it's a pretty big deal. So, you know, she said 570 million tons of food waste from households. And so I was just, I was looking in a cookbook and it was copyright 2018, but in one year alone, we threw away enough food in the United States to fill the Empire State Building 91 times. <laughs> that is crazy. And so just thinking about, you know, what can you do is maybe try to use these parts of these plants or compost or freezing leftovers maybe taking smaller portions if you're not gonna eat it all and then planning out your meals. So um, fun quiz, quiz question quick, Empire State Building. Does anyone know how many floors are in the Empire State Building? Not bad, Lisa, it's 102, you guys. So I went, I went to Peru and went to Machu Picchu and I climbed that many floors, but that's probably the only time. <laughs> all right, so let's start out with some sweet potatoes. So thinking about the greens then, it's, um, they can be prepared all the different greens pretty much the same way so um, you know how we might be more familiar with collards and kale and sometimes cabbage but you know how we cook them or you can saute them the these greens can be done the same way so i've had sweet potato greens i eat them raw a lot sometimes um that's too bitter for some people and so sauteing them can totally change them the flavor so just taking them sauteing them with a little bit of olive oil, garlic is really good with them, sometimes soy sauce, and then adding like what I did here with the slivered almonds. And then also you can eat the vines too. There's recipes that are just using that vine, that stem. Um, there's a way to take off the, just the outer layer of the stem, and then it's a little bit more um, tender, but you cook them then, and you can eat them without taking off that part also, but it's kind of like, um, Sweet potatoes taste like mild bitter green. They're not as strong as kale or collards, but they're stronger than um, Swiss chard. So once they're stir fried though, and like if you add sesame oil, bunch of garlic, it takes on that whole new flavor. So just thinking about that, um, kind of like how you might saute spinach or other winter greens, you can do that with a sweet potato vine too. And there are tons of benefits. So I was just gonna mention the nutrition, but on all these things, it's really amazing how much like the benefits are also in those leaves and um, things too. So trying to do that, use those can be really great. And then I also wanted to mention too, I always worried about just with the sweet potatoes, if I took all the leaves off, right, would the sweet potatoes be okay? <laughs> and so um, just like what I was reading is that, you know, you as long as you leave some of the the leaves on there, leave some of the leaves, um, they'll be able to be okay. So maybe, um, one person was recommending every other and maybe Alyssa, you can jump in on that if you have a thought but they can still produce as long as you don't take all the leaves yeah they're they're pretty hardy so just just okay. leave a few leaves and they'll be all right <laughs> thanks okay so then she was talking about the brassicas too so those we know these aren't cancer fighters so they're really really good for you and so brussels sprouts like the whole thing edible there all the parts including the leaves so the Brussels sprouts, you can see a plant on the left. That's one we actually have growing in Florida. And um, like Alyssa said, you know, you can't really see the Brussels. It's not gonna have enough time maybe to form the Brussels, but I've been having a lot of fun using the leaves. So, and then thinking about the cauliflower, you can use the leaves for that too, and the broccoli. And you can shred them, use them in salads, you can steam them, you can add them to stir fries. 
you can put them in a green smoothie instead of buying spinach. Um, and one of the really good ways is just sauteing them. I actually use those Brussels sprouts. They're very thick and hearty, but they, um, I cut them up really small and heat them a little bit and use them kind of as a salad green. So just by heating them, making them a little bit more tender. And then using the smaller leaves would be more tender and they tend to be sweeter also. So, um, yeah. I was there. gonna jump in just for a second, Andrea. There was a question yeah. about oxalates in the chat. Um, and so I just wanted to take the opportunity to mention, Andrea and I were talking about this beforehand. When introducing any kind of new foods into your diet, it, it's definitely recommended to, you know, talk to your talk to your doctor, especially if you're taking any kinds of um, prescription medication that that you're taking on a regular basis, because there are some um, opportunities for things to have contraindications with certain medications. So just, you know, do some of your own due diligence if you're going to start eating things that you haven't previously been eating. Thank you. It's a good, yes, I had meant to say that. Thank you for jumping in. I wanted to mention too, just, just some things about the cauliflower leaves that I found. There's recipes for cauliflower leaves, like a noodle stir fry. So they add um, the cauliflower, like the outer leaves and then carrots and celery and garlic and, and a little bit of miso, which is um, fermented soy. And then there's Japanese simmered cauliflower leaves with potato using it that way. And then one of the ways I definitely am going to try is the roasted cauliflower leaves. You know, it's fairly simple and it would be a fun way to try it. And roasting brings out the sweetness in vegetables. So I think that could be a really good one. So you take the leaves of the cauliflower, clean them, toss them with some olive oil, little salt and pepper, and then roast them um, about 400 degrees for a while, 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, broccoli leaves can be prepared the same way as the kale, Swiss collard, all those things. You can try them in soups, just like Alyssa was saying, salads, sandwiches, or even blended in a smoothie. And um, thinking about these things could also be used as a pesto substitute, which we'll talk about a little bit more, but just you can think outside the box with the greens on that, which is kind of nice. Then we have some fruit things. So what I concentrated on for strawberries and for the grapes would just be the leaves. So the tops of those strawberries are actually very good for you, which is kind of crazy. But if you, um, I have started eating the tops. <laughs> and at first I was like, why? I don't know. You know, it was, it's very odd in America. And so, but it's really good if you're a lazy eater and you don't feel like taking off all the tops and they are very good for you. So as long as I wash them really well, you know, I end up having strawberries in salads sometimes or smoothies, and then you can just throw the whole thing in there and you don't have to take out the top. And using just the tops by themselves, that's um, also done, but um, you can use them to flavor water, things like that. A lot of recipes on that, infusing vinegar and um, blending into a smoothie. You can use them in fresh salads. So thinking, you know, you're already having other greens in there. So just tossing them in there and you could, you know, when you cut off the top of the strawberry, sometimes you end up taking off quite a bit, but then you could add that to your salad, which would be really good. You could also blend them, blend, blend the strawberry tops and use them as a pesto. So, you know, you're like, I don't have basil on hand, which is the thing commonly used in pesto. You could use that. And um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that because I think that's probably the one thing in the strawberries that maybe we aren't having so much. And they have a lot of um, compounds that are like defensive against microbi microbi <laughs> microbial pathogens and beneficial properties for human health. So thinking about that. Okay, so then grape leaves too. <laughs> so I don't know why I didn't really think about this much, but if you see those grape leaves, so those you can use the muscatine grape leaves and make those same type of thing. Um, there's stuffed grape leaves and you can use things like rice and um, seasoned quinoa or shredded chicken and put that inside of there. But by um, heating those grape leaves and then adding like a salt solution, you can pickle them and they'll be really easy to um, roll up then and you can eat them, which is really, really cool. It'd be a really fun appetizer. And that's something that those um, I haven't, it's hard to like, I haven't seen them that much in the store. So it'd be really fun to be able to just have some in your yard to use for that. Okay. And then Ruby, thank you about the saying stems for, she's talking about the sweet potato stems, but for smoothies and soups can be good. Okay. Banana peels. You guys might think I'm a little crazy, but there's a guy who worked at Dole 
um, he was the head of Dole for a while and he was, that was the first time I'd heard about Ede. Um, he's, he was talking at um, one of my grad school classes and he was like, yeah, I have smoothies in the morning. I just throw in the whole banana. And we were like, are you sure the whole thing? He's yes, the peel too. And so that was when I started looking up, like, can you eat that? And yes, um, you can. And some people do. So um, I've tried it a couple of times just because they're <laughs> readily available and wanting to see kind of curious about how how they were i had them cooked and i using them when they're riper bananas you know how the peel kind of breaks down it's thinner when they're riper um that is more like um i guess a little bit more palatable and easy to digest but they are really high in fiber as you can imagine so just you know if you're gonna have them start small <laughs> but you can puree them and add them to baked goods like banana bread or smoothies um you can chop the peels add them to savory dishes for like a sweet addition, saute them, you can make banana bacon. That I've seen a few times, I'm definitely gonna have to try that. Um, cook and add in sauces, and you could use it also in place of pulled chicken or pulled pork. Kind of fun fact, um, you know, I, monkeys, they always peel the banana the opposite is of the way that this banana peel is peeled from that bottom part. And um, just one of the benefits I was reading is that when you peel it from that bottom part, it takes, you know how there's those little strings? It says like that those come come with the peel when you peel it from the bottom. I just, I just had to throw that in there, kind of a fun fact. Okay, so here is just one recipe I found and then Dole actually had some recipes using it, but this is using those banana peels, washing them and then sauteing them. <laughs> and it looks pretty good, right? Would you even know that that was banana peels? So you put them in a little bit of vinegar and water um, for a while, and then you shred the peels on a cutting board, about two inch slices, and then you toss it um, with some olive oil, some garlic, and some other seasonings, and then saute it. And you add tomatoes um, and cook until the peels are tender. So another thing I'm going to have to try. And then you add some pineapple, rice, things like that. And then Allison mentioned this too. Uh, using the banana leaves, you don't um, eat the leaf, but you can use it in any time you would use aluminum foil or parchment paper for wrapping things and then baking them or grilling them or even frying them. And the benefits of this, it was really interesting to me. That's is also something else I'm going to have to do. But just the, they have antimicrobial properties in the leaves and they also have other uh, things that are good for us. So when we cook the food in that, it imparts some of that, those nutrients into the food. And also they have this flavor that's really good that things like aluminum foil and parchment paper don't have. You know, it's a benefit that you could get them out of your yard, they would be free. And then they're also, they were, you know, just because they're so, they have a uh, shiny and it's hard for dirt to really stick to them. So it's easy to wash them and very economical, they're waterproof and they have a waxy exterior. That's what I was trying to say. So they're easy to clean and dust and they have some of those healthy properties then. So just, you could boil or submerge them in hot water to soften them. And then you can wrap different things in it. Just um, like Alyssa was saying, the fish really, really a good one. And I was seeing some with like coconut rice could be really good in there. Just using it at the same way as you'd use that aluminum foil. And people also in other countries use them as plates, which could be really nice. You'd have less less waste, right? And um, yeah, and you wouldn't have to wash dishes. Okay, and then banana flour. Okay, so this was another one I didn't know, but there's a lot of, um, it can be a great meat substitute because of its um, texture. So they contain banana blossoms, they contain significant potassium, calcium, as well as vitamins A, C, and E, apart from um, powerful flavonoids. So those flavonoids, they help um, keep disease at bay. So that's why we like those. And then you, they can be picked um, at, at the ends of the bunches when the fruit is like, you know, half grown or so. And other people like that, I don't know that much about when to pick them. And that might be something, if you're interested, I can find out more, but um, preparing them, you would take off the tough, so like on the bottom left picture, there is the banana flower. You'd take off the outer 
layers and between every outer layer are these little bananas and if they're brown you don't want to eat them but if they're yellow you can eat those little little things that would also come out um of there and when you peel it off you'll start to get to peel that is not so red it's more of a neutral color and that's usually where people start cutting it then and eating that whole thing so you could eat the whole thing it's just that that would be a little too fibrous so um kind of like trying to eat a banana leaf it just you'd be chewing for a while so using the inside and then you can cook it um and also you rinse it there's some sap that's on that but um it's pretty cool and you know a fun way to use something make a dish out of something you wouldn't have even had a lot of people that say it's you know a little bit like eating an artichoke that way where you peel off the um peel off the edges and then the artichoke is also a flower so then you get it right in the middle there <laughs> okay so squashes just like um you're talking about the leaves and the seeds can be used so on the left there, I have a picture of a Seminole pumpkin, and those grow really well in Florida. And I know that just, um, we've grown them at our extension office a few times. And they, um, as you can see, they're really prospering. And I'm able to then use the leaves and, you know, you can saute them at garlic, lemon juice, Parmesan for a side dish. They also go really well with peanut sauces or coconut-based curries. So you can um, heat the leaves and put them in there. Simmering with tomatoes is common in some other countries. And yeah, sautéing with olive oil and using it as like a pasta dish or dip. And I've also eaten them. You can also eat them raw. Um, but I just a uh, quote from somebody, you know how there's the comments on the recipes. This man says, the pumpkin greens lacked any bitterness that other greens tend to have, which surprised me. These might be the sweetest greens I've eaten. Even my son and my wife enjoyed them. The flavor reminded me of a mixture of green beans, broccoli, spinach, and asparagus. And I saw that um, repeated on a different site too. So that would be kind of how you could describe them. I really liked them too, which I was surprised. You know, they're kind of, um, sometimes they have a, like a fuzziness to them, which can be really crazy. And you're like, I don't think this is even edible, but they are. So, okay. And then just talking about herbs, quickly, the main two things I wanted to say would be, if you have any extra herbs, pesto, does anyone want to put in the chat, what are the traditional things in pesto? I mentioned it earlier, might've talked about it. What is the herb that most people use? Basil. Yes, you got it. And then what are some of the other ingredients that are in like the traditional, if you would say? Usually there's like an herb, which would be the basil or green. Yes, pine nuts and oil. Good job. There's one more thing I'm thinking. Some sort of cheese. Which cheese is often used? So I would say like olive oil, garlic, pine nuts, basil, parmesan. Yeah, you got it. So then the cool thing is about pesto is there's not really a wrong way to do it. And so you can um, substitute different uh, nuts for the pine nuts. Like some people use walnuts, you can use almonds, um, you can use cashews, and then you could do different cheeses, but you could also do use different leaves. Like I have a good friend, she always just does it with spinach because she finds that's easier to come by than having basil. So <laughs> yeah, cashews and pesto. Okay, that's awesome. So. There's a carrot top pesto, and you know, calls for carrot top leaves, then one third cup cashews, one third cup olive oil. So that would be those heart healthy fats, and then the garlic clove. And the, I have the picture of the sandwich on top because I think, you know, sometimes we think of pesto and think of maybe um, a dip or on pasta, but it's also a really good spread, like in place of mayonnaise on a sandwich. That would be giving you some really good fats. So, chimichurri then. That's another, um, it's from Argentina and it's used as both, used both as an ingredient in cooking and then a condiment for grilled meat. And so on the bottom picture, um, I went to a culinary institute and we made um, the chimchurri sauce and put it on the fish there. And it's traditionally, does it want parsley, garlic, olive oil, vinegar, chili pepper. So it has a little bit more of a kick than maybe pesto kind of a fun thing. And you can also just buy it in the grocery store. So you can make, make yourself some. <laughs> All right. And oh, yeah. So Judith was saying she just used the carrot tops um, straight up in a salad. That's really awesome. Okay, so here's just we're talking a little bit about the seeds. 
the papaya seeds are edible. And I read um, a few years back that they were edible. And so I was like, okay, I'll try them. And I did, <laughs> you know, like everybody has different flavor palettes. Some th people like some things, some people like other things. But to me, I realized I don't really like peppery stuff. And those um, papaya seeds, they definitely taste peppery. Um, but then thinking about that, then where like, you know, maybe that would be a great way to use them as a pepper, maybe not having them with the fruit, which is what I was trying to do. So thinking about how you could actually use those seeds, you can eat them raw, but you can just dry them. Like you put them on the lowest temperature in your oven and, you know, flat them out, um, kind of like you would do with sunflower seeds if you were roasting them and then dry them. And you can actually put them in your pepper going grinder and just use them for pepper. <laughs> it's kind of a fun thing. Um, and they taste a little bit like watercress, which I don't really like that either. So it's interesting. It's so good for you though. I want to like it um, and add a really rich flavor to dressings. So if I think about it, you know, using it as the peppers, pepper, that would, um, that'll really help me a lot. And then, okay, so we know like roasted pumpkin seeds, you know, they're around in the fall when they're um, available, but you can use cantaloupe seeds. They have a similar flavor and nutritional content and cantaloupe season is much longer. So we could use those too. So trying to think about using those as a year round thing. And they also, you know, sometimes they might go better in things like salads, um, dips, desserts. You could bake them in your favorite cookies because you know, they're smaller and they might just have that, just that bite that you want. So you can also eat them alone and, um, I found recipes using like there's ranch flavored, um, cantaloupe seeds, salt and pepper, cinnamon flavored. So got some options with those. And then wanted to mention too, the skin of papaya can be used as a meat tenderizer and um, it can be stored. You know, you can make it into a paste and then store it in the freezer for six months. And it's natural meat tenderizer because it has this um, um, papin. <laughs> is what it's called. And so there's different things like in, you know, bromelain is the active thing in pineapple. And so papin is in papaya. And what these things are is it's like this active thing that really helps our body. And so that is used as a tenderizer. So if you've ever put pineapple with meat, if you mix it together in like a leftover container, it'll like break down the meat. So they tenderize the thing. Um, and that's also why you can't put papaya and you can't put fresh pineapple in jello because of that papaya and, and then the bromelain is that it won't, um, the jello won't set up. So it's a random thing, but also um, Alyssa and I were talking about this before the presentation too. And, you know, just like she had said, you know, make sure just if you're doing some things, there's um, like, you know, for instance, grapefruit, it's kind of had a tough time because it, um, reacts with some medicine, but just um, papaya, there's some, um, I would love to talk to a doctor but and learn more, but just maybe not recommending to eat the papaya seeds or green pineapple. So that would be pa green papaya. So that'd be unripe papaya um, if you're pregnant. So just thinking about that, it's kind of a special time. Okay. So using that, then watermelon seeds. So just a couple more things, just roasting them. You can sprout them. Um, there's watermelon seed butter, like just kind of like peanut butter. And so when eating 100% raw, like you're not going to grow a watermelon in you, but you don't really digest them. So that's why if you can sprout them or roast them, then you can get um, some of the nutrients from that. So this, um, I was just showing you, you can actually buy like a mix with the watermelon seeds in it. And then this one, another one of the watermelon seeds, but you can kind of, it shows you the nutrition of that. So look at the protein. Um, so that's in, um, doesn't give you the serving size, but which is not very helpful, but total fat. So 12 grams. So you can see that it's mostly fat, very little carbohydrate, mostly fat and protein. So, and healthy fat because the saturated fat is only two. So it'd be a, a really good snack. And then I was talking to the people at the watermelon board. And so there's a site called watermelon.org. And it's like everything watermelon you can imagine. But they have recipes for um, sprouted watermelon seeds bites. Um, and then I've also seen instant watermelon seed cheese.
So that can be, um, they said, try it in sandwiches on pizzas and pastas. I'm definitely going to have to try this. There he said, um, it has a little nutritional yeast, if you've heard of that. And it's kind of um, has a cheesy flavor. So I could see where it could become that. But these are those watermelon seed bites, uh, the picture on the right there. And then there's the rind. So looking at this, I <laughs> they have a video of this one. So it's just all these different ways that you can use watermelon rind. So watermelon rind pickles, which I've definitely heard of, those tend to have a lot of sugar. So I was like, is there another way? Yes. So watermelon slaw, you can do a roast it, roast it. There's an apple hand pies, kimchi, you could put in cake, gazpacho, and quiche. So <laughs> she's at, all right, thanks, Valerie. I, yeah, I'm going to have to try making it sometime. And there's a watermelon rind curry. So here's just, um, I was thinking, should we see if it plays? Let's see. It'll be our test. <laughs> Kind of cool. You know, it reminds me a lot of zucchini, um, just like how you could use zucchini because it's shredded like that. And um, yeah, you know how it just kind of disappears in cooked dishes. So I was thinking it'd probably work really good in like things like chocolate cake too. You'd be like chocolate brownies. It does. It really has a neutral flavor. And I um, cut it up a lot of times and just put it with salads and they have recipes for that on there too. And just some other things I wanted to mention um that kind of random but other things that you might leave behind and you could consider using corn silks i don't know if you ever thought about eating those but those um looks like they might have some really good health benefits and um like antioxidants um lower blood sugar could be anti-fatigue and so they're doing studies on those right now and will probably continue to but um just the corn silk. So those would be the, all those little strings that you try to peel off the corn um, actually look like they could be good for you. And you could roast them and use them um, in salads. Or I've actually um, heard about people roasting them and then grinding them. And then they would use them like in a spice shaker and just put them, put them on things. But I, uh, the way I've tried them is just putting them in salads. And they remind me of um, alfalfa sprouts. You know what? I don't know if you remember having those, but and you can also eat the leaves of beans, so green beans, lima beans, soybeans. So if you're really hungry, that's an option. Skin of potato, you probably heard about that one, but a lot of the nutrition is right under that potato. Um, and then the papery shell of peanuts, really good for you too. Did you know that? Celery leaves, sometimes you could use that in case, like, say you need cilantro. You'd be like, what can I use? So thinking about the celery leaves can be used like that. And you could also make pesto out of those. Okra leaves, you can eat those too. And then kiwi skin. Um, I was just reading before, before this presentation that the skin of the kiwi has about two to three times the antioxidants of the actual kiwi. So if you can get past the, <laughs> the, the roughness of it, um, it can be really good for you. And then just, um, Alyssa, if you want to jump in too, but just like the leftover bits, saving and using the skins and the peels and the cores when you can, um, keep them in the freezer and you can make a big batch of broth. So thinking about all the like onion peels and things like that, those can make really good flavorful broth. A lot of people, a lot of chefs use those. So I think that's all I have to say, but um, I know we just have a couple other things. Alyssa, do you want to go over this slide? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So if you get to the point where you still have stuff, right? After <laughs> you, after you've watched this presentation, you've done your research, you've made a bunch of pestos, you've made a bunch of oils, all that kind of stuff, and you still have stuff, right? What do we do with it? Well, ideally, we don't put it in the landfill. As food waste gets to the landfill, it produces methane compounds and all that kind of stuff. So we don't want it to get to the landfill. So if you can compost at home, um, or if you're lucky enough to live in an area where there's municipal composting, I definitely recommend it. Um, you know, there's an old saying, compost happens, right? It doesn't need to be a really um, super scientific process. 
get yourself um, a bin that's open to the ground. Um, you can just use chicken wire if you want to make sure it has air um, circulating. And, you know, we do whole classes. There's videos online on, on composting, but really, you know, think about um, any of those things that you would normally um, throw out um, can go in the compost. Only things to avoid would be things like meats, and cheeses and oils. Um, I do put eggshells in my compost and I have put a cheese rind or two out there, um, but it's not generally recommended, especially with any meats like bones and things like that because it'll attract um, pests that you don't want in your yard. They'll go digging through their raccoons and possums and rats and all that kind of stuff. You can compost with worms. Red wiggler worms are great at decomposing food waste really quickly. Soldier fly larvae also are really great at decomposing your food really quickly. Um, you can do heat composting, slow composting, fast composting. Um, there's large containers or small containers. There's all kinds of different ways to compost. But really, ideally, what you're doing is you're taking anything that's left after you've tried really hard to eat as much as you can of the food that you have, and what you're doing with it then is you're creating nutrition for those plants you're going to eat in the future. So that compost, it breaks down. It's full of all of this wonderful microbiota, right? Because we encourage um, beneficial fungi and bacteria in that compost. It adds nutrition to our soil. It adds moisture holding capacity to our soil. It improves the ability of our plants to uptake nutrients that are available um, in the compost as well as any that we add to the soil by moderating the pH of the soil. So really compost is just an incredible opportunity for you to improve your garden or just your landscape in the future. Um, so, so check out any of our classes on composting um, and, uh, or, or contact me if, if you wanna learn more. Hmm. Question about eating foods that are not organic. Um, so I think that in, if you're planning to do things like eating the peels and rinds, right, and you're not purchasing organic produce, um, just a really good rule of thumb to make sure that you wash everything thoroughly. You don't need to buy any kind of, you know, food wash um, product. Just use regular soap or not regular soap, regular water. Just rinse everything really good um, and, and it shouldn't be an issue. Um, you know, if you, if you are concerned, there are some organizations that um, have kind of recommendations on different foods that harbor more chemical residues than others. Um, there's one I know, I don't, I can't attest to the scientific validity, but the environmental working group I know puts out a um, clean 15, I think is what they call it, list of fruits and vegetables that have the lowest um, uh, pesticide residue. Um, so you can, you know, you can look at that kind of information and, and try to make some of those um, decisions for yourself. But if you grow it yourself, then you can control what's going on to your plants, which is great. <laughs> and I have to say too, just chiming in, it's way better to eat a vegetable than not eat a vegetable. So like um, just the benefits of eating fruits and vegetables in general, we do not get enough. So um, no matter how you can get it, it would be awesome. And we know they have a lot of benefits. So, um, Meg has a question about resources for best cultivars for this area. Meg, if you want to send me an email directly, um, I can send you our Florida gardening guide that's put out through UF IFAS and it has recommendations on cultivars for our regions. Okay, thank you.